Welcome to the Open Forum. Again, God is giving us a great and wonderful opportunity to look together into the Word of God, this precious Word that comes right from the mouth of God. And particularly in this day, again, I was reviewing Ecclesiastes chapter 8, where God says in verse 5, Whoso keepeth a commandment shall feel no evil thing. That is, the, uh, the nature of a true believer is that he has an intense desire to do the will of God. And uh, because he has become a child of God, even when he takes his eyes momentarily off Christ and does fall into sin, even that sin has been covered by the blood of Christ. And so he will not feel any judgment of God. But then God goes on. uh, And in a wise man's heart, I'm reading the second part of Ecclesiastes chapter 8 verse 5 and a wise man's heart discerneth both time and judgment because to every purpose there is time and judgment therefore the misery of man is great upon him for he knoweth not that which shall be for who can tell him when it shall be In God's marvelous mercy, in His great and wonderful love, He has given in His Word the Bible, which came right from the mouth of God. He has given us finally in our day all the information God wants us to know about the timeline of history that goes all the way from creation all the way till the last day when this world will be totally destroyed the at the end of the day of judgment which we know now to be October 21 in the year 2011 and uh, God in his mercy has withheld that or, or in his wisdom let me put it that way has withheld that information until this time in history when we're right to the end and it's a time when we also know judgment that is we know a whole lot more about God's judgment plan than it had ever been known before and what a grand and wonderful privilege this is but but for those who don't know the time because they don't want to listen to what God has given and the proofs that he has given that show that indeed God has opened our eyes or has opened our knowledge of that time and the details of judgment. If they don't want to listen to that, then they're still in misery because for them Christ will come as a thief in the night. And the thief comes to steal and to kill and destroy, we read in John 10. And he comes in the night, that is, for those who are in spiritual nighttime. Uh, When people are saying today, well, we can't know. No, no, there's no possibility. We can know the day or the hour. Oh, my, they're still in great misery because it is the wonderful blessing, the wonderful love, the wonderful mercy of God that he has disclosed to us in this time uh, uh, as we're approaching the very end, uh, the very day and year of when these, this is going to happen. And there uh, are all kinds of details concerning the nature of his final judgment plan. But if we're not following the Bible, if we come in our pride and say, Oh, no, no, no. No, we know more than... We, we know God is not giving that to us. We're not, uh, that's an admission that that person is not listening to the whole Bible. But we know uh, uh, they're saying that, after all, throughout 
uh, God has said again and again, we can't know the day or the hour. And that was true, that God kept that information from the churches, from the true believers also, because he wanted us to keep our eye focused on the task of getting the gospel out into the world. But now the focus of the true believer has to be like the focus of Noah in the day when he was God was ready to destroy the world with the flood of Noah's day to warn the world and give them the timeline when it would happen so they could still cry to God for mercy or like it was in the days of the book of Jonah when Jonah was commissioned by God to tell the Ninevites who knew nothing about the Bible but yet told them your God is going to destroy you in 40 days and and uh, we read we, what we learn from the Ninevites is what our reaction ought to be as God is disclosed to us the time and judgment namely that we are to cry to God for mercy and turn away from our sins as best we can and pray oh Lord is it possible that I still might become saved that I might not have to go into that day of judgment but for those who are not listening. They know better. They know. Their preacher, their pastor has instructed them that you can't know the day or the hour. For them, the, their misery is horribly ter terrible. Why? Well, not at the moment, but wait, wait for another 21 and a half months and they will find that their misery is horrible because they will discover that they are left behind. They were not raptured as they thought they would be. They are there to endure the final judgment day with all of its horrors. Oh my, isn't it wonderful that God has given us this information of time and judgment so that we can declare it to the world and so that people uh, can cry to God for mercy. Well, this is your program. We want to hear from you. And uh, shall we take our first question tonight, please? Welcome to Open Forum. Hello, me? Yes, go ahead with your call. Yes, uh, <clears throat> I was looking through the Bible earlier this morning, and uh, I, I noticed how many times... Uh, especially towards the end of Revelations, that it mentions uh, you're going to be judged by your good deeds. And also at the end of the abomination of desolation, when, when Christ comes back to earth, the second coming, um, it says, and mankind will be, ju be judged by their deeds or actions. So I know I know you feel very strongly about this. I've been listening to you for a few weeks now, and um, I, I don't see why y you feel that dwelling on good works or good deeds negates the crucifixion. Well, here's uh, a problem. Obviously, you have to have that first. You have to have be saved by Christ first. Yeah, excuse me. If you don't do. Excuse me. What I, the problem is that we don't def know how to define good deeds. The Bible says in James chapter 2 that if we have broken the smallest commandment of the law, and remember the whole Bible is a, is a series of commandments, that laws that God has given us to obey. And if we have broken the smallest commandment, we stand guilty of the whole. We're under the wrath of God. And uh, that is why the only solution for us is to plead God for mercy. Uh, because God can look at any human being, anyone, no exceptions, and see sin. But only if Christ has paid for that sin is it possible that we can e enjoy uh, the blessing of God, the blessing of coming into our inheritance of eternal life, and so on. And uh, that is an action that God 
uh, controls. But if we look at good deeds with the idea, well, we know when we do good deeds, we know when we do bad deeds, and, and, uh, and you know, I'm going to just do good, do good, do good, and then God is going to look kindly at me. It's because we don't understand how insistent sin is. We just have to break the smallest commandment, and we, it's like we broke the whole law of God. So there's nothing in ourselves that we can trust, nothing. We, uh, I don't care how righteous we think we are, we have to plead with God, Oh, God, have mercy. Is it possible that you might look with mercy upon me and that I might be, uh, that, that I might have my sins paid for? But thank you for calling and sharing. And uh, shall we take our next call, please? Welcome to Open Forum. Praise the Lord, Brother Kemping. Um, I called you about a couple months ago, and I really didn't get to uh, express what I was trying to say. Uh, I really didn't get through. Um, I asked you about the uh, Anna Domini. I mean, uh, uh, excuse me, do you... Uh, 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 and, oh, are you asking a question about Anno Domini? Anno Domini, yeah. I would like to know if that has anything, uh, seemed like that bears testimony of Christ, um, his incarnation? No, it is, that is the, that is literally the year of our Lord. Uh-huh. And uh, we speak of uh, this year as 2009 A.D., Anno Domini. Uh, which is the year of our Lord. Presumably, it's not act. It isn't the 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 developer of the calendar made an error and uh, and missed the uh, day of Christ's birth by six years. But nevertheless, it presumably it means that 2,009 years ago Jesus was born. In actuality, right. it's six years more than that. Yeah, but I was wondering why. Uh, don't people why they uh, people did not ever set up a calendar um, basing on like George Washington somebody else's uh, birth but Christ so I believe our calendar bear testimony of Christ uh, bear witness of Christ's testimony and uh, Isaiah says that he has become, I, I, become ex- uh, excuse me now you're asking a question why is our calendar the way it is and not some other way? That's God's business, you know. Uh, it could have... Uh, every nation uh, throughout time has developed their own calendars. Calendars aren't really accurate insofar as the passage of years are concerned uh, because a calendar cannot express exactly how many days there are in a year, but they are a device that is given, that is developed to help us uh, at least have some kind of a way of measuring from year to year. Right. But like I I, am, we're learning, uh, there have to be corrections. And we just have to deal with the fact we have this calendar. And why, you're asking the question, why not some other calendar? We don't, we have no idea about that. That's not important at all. Well, the reason is, I believe Isaiah said he will become the light of the Gentiles. So by our calendar, it really bears Christ's testimony. And I believe he has come to the Gentiles through and through. And therefore, he's going to use this calendar to announce his return. And also, Christ was subjected to their calendar, which is Hebrew calendar. And this calendar never existed. Therefore, he said, no, no one knows well, I'm the sorry. day I'm, or the hour. I, I'm because sorry. The Bible doesn't give us anything like that. You're, you're, uh, you're, you're, you have a private conclusion, which may have some substance to it, but uh, it's not a conclusion based on what the Bible is teaching. We just have to let, leave that alone and know that God is, is, uh, uh, has uh, uh, guided the human race. God does guide the human race uh, uh, through all of its actions. He is in control of everything, and so guided the God did guide the making of the calendar. So what it is, 
but uh, it is not we don't find any information in the Bible that I'm aware of that uh, indicates that now this is super important because because God has guided it but thank you for calling and sharing and shall we take our next call please welcome to open forum hi Mr. Campy yes Yes, I, I, I got a question for you. Are, are you coming to Towson, Maryland again this summer for your for your uh, seminar? Uh, are we going to have another uh, 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 time uh, uh, Bible conference like we've had in previous years? We are not planning another Bible conference. No, that is not in our plans. We were hoping you were going to come again. Well, uh, we, I, I, I we know. Had the, we had the pleasure to meet you two years ago, and me and my wife, uh, Gimpy, and, and we said, oh, I'm, I'm the little guy with the glasses. You might remember me. You have to bear in mind that right now we have an awesome task. There's a world out there of seven billion people that have to be told that May 21, 2011, is the day of judgment, the first day of the day of judgment, as well as the day of the rapture. And we're trying to put all of our energy and all of our, that we possibly can on that, uh, that huge task of trying to reach uh, the whole world with this. And uh, so, uh, <laughs> these Bible conferences that we've had through the years have always been a, a splendid time to meet friends and but unfortunately, they only benefit a very, very tiny number of people compared with the size of the whole world. And so we have to uh, make choices and try to use our time as effectively and efficiently as possible in reaching as many people as possible. But thank you for calling and sharing. And uh, shall we take our next call, please? Welcome to Open Forum. Hello? Yes, welcome to Open Forum. Uh, yes, Dr. Kempton. Uh, Luke chapter 12, verse 38. Luke chapter 12, verse 38. There we read, uh, and it's, and if he come in the second, it's talk, let's start with verse 37. Blessed are those servants whom the Lord, when he cometh, shall find watching. Verily I say unto you that he shall gird himself and make them to sit down to meet and will come forth and serve them. In other words, they are the ones that will be seated at the wedding feast of the bride and the lamb because the, the wedding feast of the bride and the lamb is the completion of our salvation and when Christ comes all those who are raptured whose uh, that is they receive their glorified spiritual bodies and uh, they are the ones who are heading for the marriage feast of the bride and the lamb this is what Christ is emphasizing here and if he shall come in the second watch or come in the third watch and find them so blessed are those servants and it's now that if the good man of the horse had no, of the house had known what hour the thief would come, he would have watched and not have suffered his house to be uh, broken yeah, through. Captain, uh, the point I want to make is that uh, in this, this, he said, if he shall come in the second watch, um, actually your first book um, in 1992 probably is... Um, what God had actually desired. Oh, uh, I I don't think so. I I uh, this, you know this, there are people who try to uh, tie in that book that I wrote with a question mark after 1994 as uh, some kind of a tied into the Bible somewhere. But I'm a little uncomfortable with that because uh, 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 no book that we write is divinely inspired and. And uh, while there was a lot of truth in it, and it was a warning also, that's we have to be careful. There may be uh, information we don't know, but uh, uh, I, 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 I would rather that we just focus on what the Bible now is teaching 
and uh, I, I, I get uncomfortable or when uh, uh, someone is, and I understand why you're saying that, and I can see, uh, see why you say what you're saying, but uh, I, I would prefer not. But thank you for calling and sharing, and shall we take our next call, please? Welcome to Open Forum. Hello, Mr. Camping. How are you? Very well, thank you. Um, the question I have for you is, uh, I actually called before and asked uh, a question about, um, about you know, knowing when Christ was coming again, and you, and you did answer it, um, you know, that, that it's in the Bible. More specifically, I, I guess, or pointedly, I'm, I'm wondering, what, what is the difference now? Like, how is it that we have this understanding, and, and who else has this understanding, and how do you get that? And where does, where does that come from? I mean, it almost oh, sounds to me oh, well, like it's kind that, of like, like a revelation of some kind. I, I, I'm confused by that, so if you could answer that for me. Oh, well... Uh, you've asked a very, very good question. And uh, the, the reason we know more now is because God has opened up the Bible a whole lot. Remember, in the book of Daniel, the book of Daniel, this is something that every one of us who love the Lord and who, uh, who stand uh, before the Word of God, recognizing it is from the mouth of God, I want to know about. In Daniel chapter 12, our God had told Daniel a whole lot about the time of the end. It was very, very uh, uh, sad for Daniel. He felt very ill because of the awful things he was hearing. And then in verse 4, God said, uh, But thou, O Daniel, this is Daniel 12, verse 4, shut up the words and seal the book. Uh, even to the time of the end, many shall run to and fro, and knowledge shall be increased. And uh, in fact, in verse one, he had said, uh, "Everyone that shall well, no, that's that's uh, uh, that, uh, every, that there is talking about the book of life." But then he goes down in verse nine of Daniel twelve, "Go thy way, Daniel, for the words are closed up and sealed." till the time of the end. Now, we're right near the time of the end, and when we go to Revelation 5, we find there that God picks up what, uh, what he had spoken about in, in uh, Daniel chapter 12. We read uh, uh, in verse 1 of Revelation 5, and I saw in the right hand of him that sat on the throne a book written within and on the backside, sealed with seven seals. And I saw a strong angel proclaiming with a loud voice, Who is worthy to open the book and to loose the seals thereof? Now that is picking up what God had written in the book uh, 2,500 years earlier, or actually 500 years earlier, uh, than uh, uh, when he's writing this in Revelation, but but it, but what's happening here is something that's happening in our time, about uh, and it was written about 2,500 years ago. Who is worthy to open the book? And no man in heaven, not on earth, neither under the earth, was able to open the book, neither to look thereon. And I wept much. This was uh, the Apostle John who is. He just upset uh, that Daniel was was sick because he had to write these things in the book because they were so awful. And here we see uh, again an emotional outburst on the part of John uh, the apostle as he wants to know what is in that book. Because he says, "I wept much because no man was found worthy to open and to read the book, neither to look thereon." And one of the elders said to me, Wait not. Behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, hath prevailed to open the book and to loose the seven seals thereof. And I beheld, and lo, in the midst of the throne and of the four living creatures in the midst of the elders stood a lamb as it had been slain, having seven horns and seven 
eyes, which are the seven spirits of God, sent forth unto all the earth. And he came and took the book out of the right hand of him that sat upon the throne. And when he had taken the book, the four living creatures and the four and twenty elders fell down before the Lamb, having every one of them harps and golden vials full of it of fragrances which are the prayers of the saints. And they sang a new song, saying, Thou, that's the Lord Jesus Christ, art worthy to or take the book and to open the seals thereof, for thou wast slain and hast redeemed us to God by thy blood out of every kindred and tongue and people and nation. Now, we will go on reading in Revelation. And he opened, in his chapter 6, he opened the first seal, the second seal, the third seal. And finally, the book was completely open when we get to Revelation 8, verse 1, where we read, And when he had opened the seventh seal, now the book is open. There was silence in heaven about the space of half an hour. And we know in our day, because that book has been opened, that this verse is referring to the first day, of the great tribulation, the final 23 years that were now coming to an end uh, just before Judgment Day itself. And that is why today, or in the last 20 years or so, we have learned so many things like the time uh, details and the, whole, the development of God's timeline of history, all kinds of new information about God's judgment plan, lots of new information about Christ and paying for our sins, all of this because the book has been opened. So it's not because we're smarter or wiser. It just happens to be that we're living at that time when God is open this up and that is why we're so we're teaching so many things in family radio that the churches are not teaching because they are not aware that that the book has been opened and that they should be uh, studying the bible all, all together again hold on for just a moment we have to pause for this message the churches are filled with people who are sincere they're moral, they're wonderful people, uh, and they are trusting all that their church has taught them. That's why they are there. And there are a couple of bi- these, this, there's a couple billion people like this, but they are not listening to the whole Bible. They're not aware that we're living in a day when God is opening our eyes to all kinds of new truth. Because what he had sealed in the in the days of Daniel now has been opened up, and God is 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 opening the eyes, spiritual eyes of those who are really searching the Bible all together, and so it's very sad if you're in a church and you're uh, you're just trying to be as faithful as possible to your confessions and your creeds and. Uh, and living as moral and decent a life as possible, unfortunately, you're still in the spiritual darkness. You're not listening to the whole Bible. You're not included at this point in what we're reading in Ecclesiastes chapter 8, where it says the true believers will know time and judgment. And in the churches... Time is not known. They do not know the, the year of creation. They do not know for sure the year of the flood. They don't know the year that Abraham entered the land of Canaan. Uh, none of that has been made available to the churches until our day. And, and with that comes also all of this information that's so important uh, that we realize that we're right at the time of the end. But thank you for calling and sharing, and shall we take our next call, please? Welcome to Open Forum. Hi, Mr. Camping. Are you sticking with me? Go ahead oh. with your call, please. Oh, okay, Mr. Camping. Um, I was looking at something, Matthew 27, verses 45 and 46, and I had an idea about it. 
And I wanted to run it past you and see what you thought about that. Matthew 27. Yes, sir. Let's turn to that. Matthew 27, verse 45. There we read. Now from the sixth hour there was darkness over all the land until the ninth hour. And about the ninth hour Jesus cried with a loud voice, saying, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani, which is to say, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Some of them that stood there when they heard it uh, said, The man calleth for Elijah, uh, and so on. Now what is your question? Mr. Camping, I am, I've been thinking for the last couple of days that, um, and hear me out, I'm thinking that this is a picture of the very last day, and that Christ is a picture of man, asking God, why did you forsake me? I'm thinking that this is a picture of the last day, and, um, and darkness is in, is, in the, um, is in the picture also. I think that um, God's going to return, the sign of the end will be God will return the earth to darkness, it's going to blacken the sun. I'm thinking oh, that this I, is I, the last day. I, I think you're uh, on, on the right track. I do believe this three hours of Stygian blackness was a portrait of Judgment Day, the five months of Judgment Day, when there was no gospel of any kind. Remember, until the first day of the Day of Judgment, which is May 21, 2011, there has always been the light of the gospel in the world. That has always been there to some degree. But now at Judgment Day, after all the, uh, and uh, simultaneously all the believers are resurrected or are, and are caught up to be with Christ, there is no salvation of any kind. The world is in is the in a darkness of sin. Uh, darker than it's ever, ever, ever been. And uh, this, I believe, was typified uh, uh, by the three hours of darkness that uh, Christ is speaking of. And you of. know, you have the, the day and you have the year, but the hour of the day you don't have. The hour is in this passage. It says the sixth hour. It gives the hour. You have the year and the day, but the hour you don't have. The hour is given in, in this passage. Well, it was from the ninth hour, now from the sixth hour, that would have been noon time uh, until the ninth hour, from noon time to three o'clock. It would have been that, and it was in the the year would have been 33 A.D. We could that's we have that with quite great precision. Yeah, I'm just thinking that maybe the hour that you don't have is is given to you in this passage right here. Well, that's my first question, Mr. Camping. And thank you, by the way. Um, my second question would be, sir, um, do you think that the sign of, in the end of time is that God will blacken the earth, or black, excuse me, blacken the sun? I was reading something in Amos 8, verse 9, and it appears that God's going to blacken the sun as a sign to the world that this is the last... This yeah, no, the fact is that when we search the Bible, remember Christ spoke in parables... And we have to be very, very careful when we look at any sentence uh, to look at it in the light of everything the Bible teaches. And there's no evidence that I'm aware of anywhere in the Bible that indicates that there will be any change in the celestial system until the last, the final day of the uh, end of the Day of Judgment, October 21. All through the day of judgment, the sun will shine, uh, the moon will be there every evening, the day, one day will follow the next day, night will follow day, all of that will be constant. It's, it, whenever it's, uh, but it is talking about the sun uh, not shining and the, and the moon being turned to blood or, or, or not shining at all, and that has to be understood spiritually because during that that five months period there is no mercy no grace no possibility of salvation it is only a time of punishment that God is vesting or bringing on those who 
uh, are are still living because uh, and it'll also be a time of enormous death death will be everywhere it'll be a, a, a horrendously horrible uh, experience for this earth but thank you for calling and sharing and uh, shall we take our next call please welcome to open forum good evening mr campion how are you very well thank you I praise the Lord that he enabled you to celebrate your 88th birthday. And um, uh, I have uh, two questions. Hello? Yes, what is your first question? Um, can we look at um, Second Chronicles 30, um, verses 8 to 12? Second Chronicles, chapter 30, verse... 3, 0, verses 8 to 12. 3, 0, verses 8 to 12... There we read. Now be not, God is speaking, now be not stiff-necked as your fathers were. And it's uh, talking about, uh, um, well, it's in the days of Hezekiah. And Hezekiah was a king who really loved the Lord. And uh, now God is giving a message. Now be ye not stiff-necked, as your fathers were, but yield yourselves unto Jehovah, and enter into his sanctuary, which he has sanctified forever, and serve Jehovah your God, that the fierceness of his wrath may turn away from you. For if ye turn again unto Jehovah your brethren, and your children shall find compassion before them, that lead them captive, so that they shall come again into this land." For Jehovah your God is gracious and merciful and will not turn away his face from you if you return unto him. So the posts passed from city to city through the country of Ephraim and Manasseh, even unto Zebulun. But they laughed them to scorn and mocked them. Nevertheless, uh, divers, that is, different ones of Asher and Manasseh and of Zebulun, humbled themselves and came to Jerusalem. Also in Judah the hand of God was to give them one heart to do the commandment of the king and of the princes by the word of Jehovah. Now, what is your question? Um, in, in, um, my question is concentrated on verses 10 and uh, 11. Um, when, when we are bringing the gospel to the world right now, would you say that um, verse 10 is um, um, relating to those in Noah's days who were mocking, and in, in verse 11, it relates to the Ninevites who humbled themselves? Well, the, these are two reactions that God emphasizes. One is that uh, there are those who are mocking the Bible. They're scorning the Bible. They, they are wise guys. They know more than God knows. They truly believe. They're walking in their pride. And that's always been the case. Uh, and uh, except that we don't see this in the book of Jonah, amazingly, with the Ninevites. Uh, they were not mocking God. They were completely broken. Uh, they were weeping before God and crying to Him for mercy. But, uh, but other than that, ordinarily, there's always plenty of people who are mocking God. And yet, in, uh, amidst them, there is a remnant chosen by grace that, that recognize, we don't know anything, O oh Lord, you teach us, and... And as we learn these things from God, they, they break down in their, in their fear and in their uh, brokenness and in their humility. Oh, Lord, we don't know anything. Teach us. Oh, Lord, we, we are in deep trouble. Have mercy. Have mercy. But thank you for calling and sharing. And shall we take our next call, please? Welcome to Open Forum. Hi. How you doing? This is Darrell Vaughn speaking. Yeah. Um, I heard you talk about the day and month of the rapture yeah. as, as 5-21-2011. May 21, 2011, yes. Yes, sir. Praise God. And can you tell me exactly what that means by the rapture? You also identified another day as October 21st. Is that the same year, 2011, at the end of the judgment period? Yeah, the rapture is the final completion of God's salvation plan. Uh, those who are saved 
uh, uh, th during the 13,023 years of the duration of the earth, uh, they uh, uh, were, their sins were all paid for long before God ever created the earth. But the God had uh, to apply that salvation to them. And first of all, they became saved in the sense that they were given a new resurrected soul, a brand new resurrected soul, and that occurred at the time that they became saved, whether it was as a baby or as an elderly person or someplace in between. Uh, that That is uh, the second step in our salvation that God applied it to our lives. But there's, we still have a body that's an integral part of our personality, and it's still spiritually dead until the last day of, uh, of salvation on this world. Then God is going to give every true believer that has ever walked on the face of the earth their brand new resurrected body. Uh, those who have died, uh, their bodies will be resurrected out of the tomb, wherever they were buried, or and whatever's left of them, and it will be resurrected a glorified spiritual body. If we happen to be living at that time, and there are great many people will be who are who have just become saved, we will instantly be changed into our glorified spiritual body, and uh, together we will be caught up to be with Christ. And that means now our salvation is complete. Our redemption is altogether complete. We're uh, uh, completely ready to spend eternity future in the new heaven and the new earth as co-heirs with, uh, with the Lord Jesus Christ, reigning with Him. And that, uh, but on they the other a, hand... Do they still have a chance to come to Christ after that period? There's no possibility. None, none, none. If that's why it is so merciful of God that He's given us this time right now. Of uh, we still have a little more than 21 months before that day arrives, and we can still cry out to God for mercy, just like the Ninevites did in the Book of Jonah. And God does tell us in His Word that if today He is saving a great many people. He is saving. We don't know where they are. They're individuals uh, that God is working directly with, but uh, He is saving. And so now is the time to cry out to mercy for God's mercy. And when we get to May 21, 2011, no more mercy. We've waited too long. There's no... We can cry and scream and yell and, and whatever we want, but we are doomed that we're going to, uh, we're under the wrath of God. Thank you for calling and sharing. And, and you know, I, I, I really uh, marvel at the mercy of God that He is giving us this advance warning. We have, uh, we, uh, this, uh, compared with the 40 days that the Ninevites got uh, in the book of Jonah, uh, this uh, is that we still have 21 and a half months. That's a long time, and yet it's a very short time. It certainly is no time to be in denial. It's no time to be a smart aleck and say, "Oh no, I don't buy it. I don't believe it." Uh, be wise. Be a wise guy. It's not time for that. It's time to say, "Oh, boy, this is horrible. This is terrible." Oh, God, have mercy. Open my eyes. Uh, oh, Lord, is, this, is, this is awful. Could it be that I, too, might be ready to go to be with Thee uh, so that I will not enter that day of judgment? But thank you for calling and sharing. And uh, shall we take our next call, please? Welcome to Open Forum. Harold. Yes, Welcome. How are you this evening, my friend? Very well, thank you. Oh, I, I have a, a lot of people have been asking me this question. If God is so merciful, so merciful as He is, then why would He not give? It, why would He not put His heart in everybody? Well, the problem is that 
that the, the God's law stipulates and God is under the law. He, he, he has to follow the law of the Bible just as we do. And the law says the wages of sin is death. Now, when God put man in uh, on this earth, uh, he really uh, did something very wonderful. But he, why did he choose you and choose this one? And uh, excuse not me, excuse me. Let me follow this out. God did something very, very wonderful. He gave us a beautiful earth. I would think of all the warm sunshine and all the good times we have. I'm talking about unsaved people. You know, maybe they know nothing about Christ, uh, and uh, and uh, they uh, have good health basically, and and they uh, they love uh, the various uh, foods that they eat, and and uh, it's just been a, a a real real good thing here. And in the measure that they obey the law of God, uh, they uh, they keep out of trouble, uh, so that uh, they really have a very joyful experience here and but they never became saved and they die and okay uh, that's the end of them they there's no more punishment uh, that they will feel or experience uh, now uh, uh, consciously and uh, and uh, yeah and so they have had a very very good experience on earth now on the other hand if they have been uh, uh, engaging in sexual lust if they have been uh, in rebellion against the uh, the law, and they've been stealing and lying and so on. Yeah, they b brought all kinds of difficulties upon themselves, and life has been pretty miserable for them. But basically, people who are who are following the law of God, even though they're not elected of God, they're not they're not saved or whatever. God has been very very merciful to them. And they die, and that's the end. They never, they they don't even know that they have been punished for their sins in that punishment that they have that that they have not experienced is that they do not have eternal life. They are they are not going to be with Christ forever more. But on the other hand. Now that we're right near the end, and God is telling the whole world, and he's making sure that the whole world is aware that God is speaking, that this time that we have come to the time of the end, and, and, uh, and there is a judgment day coming, uh, God, uh, for those who now mock him or they, they turn away from him, they, they are in denial, they pay no attention, they don't... They don't have any respect at all for the authority of the Word of God. They will consciously experience far more suffering during that, uh, however long they're living, during that five months of the Day of Judgment. A great many of them will be dead the first day. Millions undoubtedly will die on the first day. And every day there will be more millions that are dying. Death will be everywhere. And the moment they die then they're, con they're, they're no more conscious of the wrath of God. But the moment uh, that that day begins, they will be conscious of that something awful is going to happen. And uh, that is, uh, that's the way God has uh, set up his judgment plan. And uh, that is why it's so serious that we listen to God today very carefully. Uh, because on the, on the other hand, there's still the possibility he might, I might become saved if I'm not already saved. But thank you. Uh, and when he chose one or uh, someone to become saved, that's God's business. He, uh, that God is sovereign in all these things. It's, uh, we can't say, uh, we can't say to God, well, why didn't you choose me or why did, why didn't you, why did you choose the other person? That's God's business. But he is merciful and kind and loving to his whole, everybody in creation, uh, except when we rebel against him. And the greater our rebellion is, uh, the more we're going to suffer in this world. But shall we take our next call, please?
Welcome to Open Forum. God well, bless you, brother. Yes, well. You, you talked about another period of 21 and a half months. What is that period, and when does that occur? That is the time from today until May 21, 2011. In another two weeks, it won't be uh, 21 and a half months. It'll only be 21 months. In and another... also, sir, a gentleman asked earlier, where do you get the information? You started talking about no increased knowledge in the Word because of the times that we're in, but you didn't exactly give where it said the date or how you came up upon the date of 5-21-11. Well, you know... This uh, we have in Family Radio. We have caref we have prepared uh, books that uh, like we're, uh, we're almost there. And uh, to God be the glory, showing exactly how we found uh, how these dates were arrived at from the Bible. They have all come from the Bible, and amazingly, in the last few months, God Himself has given us great proofs that our homework has been done accurately, that God has guided us with great accuracy, because he's indicated that in Second Peter chapter 3, verse 8, that there are exactly 7,000 years from the time that Noah's the flood destroyed the world in Noah's day until this destruction would begin, and long ago we learned from the Bible that, no, that the flood of Noah's day was in the year 4990 B.C., and we learned from the Bible that the end of the world is in 2011 A.D., and when we add those two numbers together, we get 7,001 calendar years, but we have to subtract one year because there's no year zero, in the calendar, in actuality, there were are exactly 7,000 years from jo Noah's flood until this day of judgment of 2011. And, and uh, God is showing us that, that uh, we've done our homework accurately. As a matter of fact, according to the calendar that was being used in that day, uh, it was the 17th day of the second month that uh, that the flood waters began to come. The good God shut the door of the ark, and in, in ma amazingly, May 21. When we look at the biblical calendar that God gives us for our day, it's again the 17th day of the second month. My my, isn't that something that God has given us that proof? And there are other proofs that are equally uh, astonishing, and that assures us that indeed God has guided us very accurately by God's mercy. He has opened our eyes correctly, that even as he promised in Ecclesiastes chapter 8, when he says the true believers would know time and the day and, and judgment that is more and more about God's judgment plan. And that is exactly what has happened in our day. But thank you for calling and sharing. And uh, shall we take our next call, please? Welcome to Open Forum. Welcome to Open Forum. The number is 1-800-322-5385. 1-800-322-5385. And shall we take our next call, please? Welcome to Open Forum. Hello, um, Brother Campin? Yes. Yes, I have a question. Um, and that question is, can you please be specific um, in describing what the next uh, 20 or uh, 22 months are going to be like leading up to the rapture? Oh, I think uh, the, from what we can read in the Bible, they're going to be like the la last 21 and a half months. In other words, we're, we every day brings us one day closer. God is to saving people all over the world on an individual basis, one by one, not 
He's not saving anybody in the churches because they are being ruled over by Satan. That will continue right to the end, and the Holy Spirit is not saving anyone there at all. And uh, and uh, we will continue to have opportunity to share this with others, and, and others will share it with others so that every day that goes by, more and more people will hear about this, that May 21, 2011 is the day. Watch out, watch out, watch out. And I think it'll just go on that way right up till that day, time. We're continuing with the open forum, and shall we take our next call, please? Welcome to open forum. Uh, yes, I have two questions, please. Uh, one is uh, Daniel 4, when it's talking about Nebuchadnezzar becoming a beast. Yes. And he loses his kingdom and he's humiliated and everything. I was wondering if there's any relationship with that and him being cast for a thousand years uh, down in AD 33 throughout the church age. Uh, I, the, there may be. I, I'm not really qualified to answer that question. It's been a long time since I've looked at that, and so I don't feel like I can answer it uh, with any uh, certainty, and I don't want to speculate. Okay, uh, Ahaz is a sundial that just talked about in Hezekiah's day, and it turned back 10 degrees. Yeah. Uh, that is, you know, I've been looking it up on the Internet trying to figure out, you know, because it talks about degrees or steps that are in this type of sundial, and I can't really figure it out or find out what it is. And I'm wondering, do you know what the 10 degrees is? Is it a 10 hours? Is it 10 steps? I have, have you no, ever looked at that? I have no idea. I'm quite familiar with that passage. But remember, for the sun to go back 10 degrees on the sundial means that God had to interrupt all the celestial activity of our solar system. Uh, and and uh, just as when he extended the day in the book of Joshua, uh, there, there, there was a, an elongated day. Uh, uh, it was the other way. They, uh, and may, uh, maybe, uh, maybe uh, the, God simply brought the sundial back or brought the solar system back to where it was before uh, it had elongated it in the day of Joshua. I don't know. I I don't. I'm I'm just uh, it, it, speculating the- on that. But the fact is, this is the thing. You know, when when w- this whole world is this whole universe is bound together by laws, laws of gravity, laws of uh, different physical laws, and and uh, it's because of these laws that the earth does what it does as it goes around the sun, the moon, as it goes around the earth. And when the earth, if the, if the, if the earth stops going around the sun for any, any length of time, maybe a few minutes or a few hours, suddenly those laws are severely interrupted. And, uh, and uh, one would expect that the earth would fly off and and get out of focus uh, with the sun altogether. But it is underscoring that God is God, that he rules this universe, and he can do what he wants to do with the sun and the moon and the stars uh, and the planets, and uh, uh, he rules over them. Uh, they, uh, he is not subject to those laws any more than when Jesus walked on water. You know, the law of gravity would stipulate that when he was standing on the water, he ought to sink. Uh, if you or I would do it, of course, we're going to sink. But he walked on the water, indicating that he is the ruler over all of the laws that he has established that by which he governs the physically governs this universe as well as how he spiritually governs this world. Uh, thank you, Brother Campbell. Thank you for calling and sharing. And shall we take our next call, please? Welcome to Open Forum. Hello, Mr. Captain. How are you? Very well, thank you. Uh, one quick question, sir. Then you go to the next call. I'll take my uh, answer off the air. Uh, in this world. In this universe, and you've been a teacher for over 40 years of teaching the Bible, the Word of God. 
can you think of anything that a human being won't do? Can I think of anything a human being won't do? Can I think of anything he won't do? Well, there's a lot of things they can't do, of course. They, uh, because we are very limited in our intelligence, our minds are very limited, our, uh, our uh, uh, strength is very limited, uh, our timeline of living is very limited. Uh, uh, we're all under the, under the uh, limitations that God has placed upon us. Uh, he, although we are very, very superior to the animals, uh, we have minds that are, can uh, can do a lot of things an animal can't possibly do. We're a different creation altogether. But on the other hand, we can't do any more than what God has has uh, uh, allowed us to do. And uh, uh, and of course, that has another side of the coin, and that is that that means that. We can very humbly go to God, recognizing He is the giver of strength and health and wisdom, and pray or and beg the Lord and beseech Him. Oh Lord, could I uh, walk more humbly before You? Could I be more faithful? Could I, uh, could I, uh, I pray for strength for today and so on? And and this, it 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 really that's the positive side of all this, that we're. Uh, we, if we recognize we're totally in the hand of God, it gives us a lot of encouragement. But thank you for calling and sharing. And shall we take our next call, please? Welcome to Open Forum. Hello. Yes. Yeah, my question is this. Good evening, sir. Thanks for doing a very great job. Um, my question is, well, according to the law, uh, Bible, it said, I will have mercy unto whom I will have mercy to. That says the Lord. But why is it that um, at the end of the day, some people will not receive the mercy of God, while some people who are sinners are going to receive the mercy of, mercy of God? Well, when God is talking about that particular statement, I will have mercy upon whom I will have mercy, he is talking about his salvation plan. And he emphasizes this in several places in the Bible. Like He emphasizes that he's like the potter who's making clay uh, pots, and he makes one pot to, uh, to honor and another to dishonor. But he is the maker of the clay, and he has a right to do that. And God has given us this world. He, we were created perfect. We were created perfect. We were uh, all in the loins of Adam and Eve, and, and we were created in the image and the likeness of God. And we, beginning with Adam and Eve, rebelled against God. That is, we became wiser than God, or thought we were wiser than God. This has been the nature of man ever since the beginning, uh, ever since he fell into sin, we have an enormous pride. The Bible talks about that again and again. As, and that's why it always kind of shocks me in a way when I say, you know, the Bible tells us that uh, about this piece of information or that, and someone will say to me, oh, no, it doesn't, oh, no. And I think, oh, you know more than God, I see. How can that be? Uh, because, oh, my, mankind is proud. And I know even in my own life, I have to pray again and again, Oh, Lord, keep me humble, absolutely humble, because I am nothing. It is only only thy mercy that I can know anything from the Bible, or I can walk in a way that is pleasing to you. But uh, this, uh, this uh, when God decided to make payment for the sins of certain ones so that he could have them, those individuals with him forevermore in the new heaven and the new earth. That was God's right to do. But he didn't. He Look at all the other people that were uh, that he didn't uh, save. They still, uh, they, they, most of them have died without even recognizing that they were, that they were punished by God. They, they had a very 
lovely time here on this earth, and then they died. And that's the, they'll never know any further punishment. It's only today when God is making a big point of the fact that uh, now he is warning the world that the day of judgment is. He wants everybody to hear that and uh, to react. And uh, if we're not reacting with with uh, total brokenness, we're going uh, we're going to be surely in trouble. And even if we act, react and think we're totally broken before God, we still. Uh, do not dictate to God. We pray like the Ninevites. Oh God, is it possible? Is it possible that you still might have mercy on me? And for many, God will have mercy. But thank you for calling and sharing. And shall we take our next call, please? Welcome to Open Forum. Hello, Brother Kempin. Good evening. Yes. Hello, Brother Kempin. Yes, good evening. What is your question? Yes, uh, shall we go to uh, First Samuel, chapter 14? First Samuel, chapter 14, yes. And then uh, read from verse 27 to 30. Verse 27, there we read... Um, uh, Saul was king, and he had given a, 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 a law... A, a command to all of his soldiers that until a certain time nobody was to partake of any food and everybody was getting it was very very difficult for everyone to obey that because they were weary from the fighting and uh, his, Saul's own son Jonathan disobeyed we read but Jonathan that was the son of King Saul heard not when the father charged the people with the oaths, wherefore he put forth the end of it, the rod that was in his hand and dipped it in a honeycomb and put his hand to his mouth and his eyes were enlightened. Then answered one of the people and said, Thy father straightly, that is very strongly, charged the people with an oath, saying, Cursed be the man that eateth any food this day. And the people were faint. Then said Jonathan, My father hath troubled the land. See, I pray you, how mine eyes have been enlightened, because I taste a little of this honey. How much more, if haply the people had eaten freely today of the spoil of their enemies which they found, for had there not been now a much greater slaughter among the Philistines. Now what is your question? I'm trying to understand uh, what the Lord is trying to teach us here spiritually, because I do know that there is a spiritual message here, but I just said... Uh, well, spiritually, you know, in the, the Bible, it teaches that the kingdom of God is like a land flowing with milk and honey. Honey is a picture of the Word of God. And, uh, and uh, Saul effectively was uh, spiritually telling the people don't listen to the word of God. Now, he didn't intend it to be that way, but that is the message that God is t uh, teaching here. You know, like today, there in the churches, uh, there, are all, there are people who are searching the Bible and trying to find truth, and they're coming up uh, to questions, and they've gone to their elders or their deacons or their pastor and asking, now, what does this mean? And uh, because their pastor or their elders have never studied that particular thing, it has nothing to do, uh, say in their con confessions about that. They say, "Look, don't, 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 don't be busy about that. Forget about that. Uh, just, just follow the rules that we have given you here in this church, and you're you're safe and secure in the arms of Jesus." In other words, they're telling their people, "Don't." eat of the word of God don't look for more truth just like Saul was telling the people don't eat any honey and Jonathan is demonstrating that no if we eat honey that is if we listen to the word of God that is where our strength comes from uh, not by denying ourselves the word of God but by searching it out and we should never cease to be searching out the Word of God 
to learn what we can. Thank you, brother. Thank you for Thank calling you. and sharing. And uh, shall we take our next call, please? Welcome to Open Forum. Yeah, I had a question for you. But first, uh, to be a good steward of your money, you can't waste it. So I was wondering, uh, if, if you leave your money in the bank after May the 21st, 2011, it'll all be wasted? So I was wondering, Mr. Camping, are you being a good steward? Are you using your money now? Are you taking it out of the bank? Or are you yeah, leaving uh, it in there? Excuse me. The fact is that everyone has to answer their own uh, question about that. And, uh, and uh, uh, everyone's personal. Remember, but the Bible says the left hand is not to know what the right hand. Uh, I can only tell you that uh, uh, that this business of... The end of the world is a big, 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 big deal in my life, and it affects me in every possible way. But the details of what I do, that's not your business at all, any more than it's my business to know what you do. That is something that each individual has to work out in his own life. But thank you. Will it be wasted? Thank you for calling. And ask and raising your question, and shall we take our next call, please? Welcome to Open Forum. Good evening, Brother Camping. How are you tonight? Very well, thank you. Uh, Brother Camping, can we look at the book of Jeremiah, chapter 39? Jer verse Jeremiah, chapter 39, and which verse? Verses 17 and 18. And relate that to Jeremiah 52, verse 25. Jeremiah 13, verse 17 and 18. But uh, I will deliver thee. No, uh, Brother Cam, uh, Jeremiah chapter 39. 39, Jeremiah 39, I'm reading that. And verse 17, that's, but I will deliver thee in that day, saith Jehovah. Is that the wrong verse? Uh, that's the correct verse, Brother Cam. I'm sorry? Yes, that's the right verse. Okay. But I will deliver thee in that day, saith Jehovah, and thou shalt not be given into the hand of the men of whom thou art afraid. And I will surely deliver thee, and thou shalt not fall by the sword. But thy life shall be for a prey unto thee, because thou hast put thy trust in me, saith Jehovah. Now, and he's really talking here. Jeremiah 50. Verse 25. Verse 22. Verse. Incidentally, this this particular statement is to a black person by the name of Ebed Melech, who uh, God has indicated is a true child of God, and God was going to take care of it. Ebed Melech, as He takes care of all the true believers during this time when Satan is ruling in the churches and ruling in the world like he hasn't officially ruled uh, for the last uh, 21 years uh, and uh, and uh, uh, or or, or uh, the last excuse me the last 1955 years before the beginning of the great tribulation which began 21 years ago now he is ruling and uh, that that is what God has in view. Now, Jeremiah 52, verse, verse 25. 25, there we read, he took all, and let's, let's start with verse 24. And the captain of the guard, that's of the, uh, of the Babylonians now, they have conquered uh, 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 Judah. They took Sariah, the chief priest, and Zephaniah, the second priest, and the three keepers of the door, he also took out of the city the eunuch, which had the charge of the men of war, and seven men of men that were near the king's person, which were found in the city, and the principal scribe of the host, who mustered the people of the land, and threescore men of the people of the land that were found in the midst of the city. So Nebu, Nebuzar Aden, the captain of the guard, took them and brought them to the king of Babylon to Riblah. And the king of Babylon smote them and put them to death at Riblah in the land of Hamath. Thus Judah was carried away captive out of its own land. Now you see God is giving two, uh, two uh, uh, alternative views. 
One is, he's using Ebed Melech as a picture of the true believers. That, uh, that uh, he was ready to be taken captive. He was uh, not in, he was trying to be obedient to whatever God had told him to do. He was a picture of a true child of God. On the other hand, these people that we read about in Jeremiah 52, they knew better than God. They never, they're like the people who are left in the churches today. God has said, get out. I, 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 when you see the abomination of desolation in the holy place, flee to the mountains. That is, flee to Christ. But, oh, no, no, no. The people in the churches know better. They know that that, uh, that cannot be saying to get out of the church, so they're going to remain there. And uh, what happened to those who remained in the Babylon uh, 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 and were not trying to follow God's law at all they were destroyed by the Babylonians they, that is that's a picture of coming under the wrath of God and so it will be those who are left in the churches they are really setting themselves up for the day of judgment they will be entering the day of judgment and oh what a horrible horrible time that will be for them. Uh, Brother Camping, this eunuch here in verse 25, that's not Ebed Menet? The eunuch Ebed Melech is not in view in Jeremiah 52. Uh, there were many eunuchs. The eunuchs were servants of the king. That was, that was a, 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 a normal thing that would happen to someone who was in the service of a, of a king, that they were castrated so they would be a eunuch and Ebed Melech happened to be a eunuch but there were other eunuchs also but thank you for calling and sharing and shall we take our next call please welcome to Open Forum Hi Brother Camping how are you? Very well thank you Yeah I have a question about um, John 11 John chapter 11, 11. Um, it's just I want to know about Lazarus. Why did he he love Lazarus so much? Like I don't hear anything else about Lazarus until it seems like John eleven, and then, and then there's this Lazarus that he loves so much. Well, that uh, you know, the Bible speaks about the beloved are the ones who are particularly loved of God because He has made them His children they are going to be the bride of Christ the moment that we are saved if we've truly become saved we're not talking about we think we're saved or we know we're saved because of something we have done but when God knows that we have become saved we've received our new resurrected soul at that moment we become officially the bride of Christ and just like there is a special love between the husband and the bride uh, 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 and his wife, uh, uh, because once you're the bride, you're going to be the wife of your husband, uh, then there is a special love. And that special love was on Lazarus also and his two sisters, uh, Mary and uh, Martha. Mm -hmm. And I have one more question. Yes. About the Jewish people. And um, was there a time that they were the chosen people? But uh, uh, why do they still think that they, they are the chosen people? And were they ever the chosen people? Well, they were chosen in the sense that God used the nation of Israel to be a portrait or a picture of the kingdom of God. In that sense, they were chosen. Uh, they were a special nation uh, that God used to typify the kingdom of God, particularly for the whole period from the day of uh, uh, going out of Egypt until Christ was crucified. That was a period of 1,480 years. Then God chose the churches to represent the kingdom of God for the next 1955 years the churches every every congregation or wherever it might be in the world uh, took on a special uh, special position with God but 
in, it, because the Israel was chosen to represent the kingdom of God, it did not mean that those within national Israel became saved. There was only a tiny little remnant that actually did become saved just because of the churches uh, during their 1955 years uh, typified the kingdom of God in this world. Uh, they did not mean that they, the, the people in the churches were saved either. Again, oh, it's only a tiny little remnant that ever did become saved. But thank you for, you know, the, uh, the, the ones that are finally are chosen by God were the ones that God actually did save and their uh, remnant at any time in history. But in our day, particularly when the last shall be first, that is the last ones hearing the gospel and they're hearing it uh, in its true as, uh, in, a, in a correct way as, where God has opened our eyes to a whole lot of truth in our day, and there are many that are becoming saved, and they now are the chosen ones, anyone who does become saved. But thank you for calling and sharing. And shall we take our last call, please? Welcome to Open Forum. God bless you, sir. Uh, I have two questions. One, is there any significance to the date October 21st? Because I thought you said something about October 21st earlier. And second, most importantly, what can we do now in these last 21 and a half months to help as many people as we can come to Christ? Well, the, read the book of Nineveh, the book of Jonah. Uh, there, the, the Ninevites, they didn't know much at all about the Bible. They didn't know anything about the Lord Jesus. They didn't know, hear the word salvation. And yet we know from Matthew 12, Matthew 12, that they did become saved. Well, and they were told that in 40 days God was going to destroy them. Now you read that very slowly and very carefully, and then pray the Lord that that might be your attitude, as I have to pray that that's my attitude uh, as we approach this end, because they had somehow... Uh, were doing the right thing. They were crying to God for mercy. They were totally broken before God. They know, they knew they deserved the wrath of God, but they were asking, Oh, Father, oh, God, is it possible? Is it possible that you might change your mind? And because the whole city, from the king on down to the most humble person, uh, sat in sackcloth and ashes that was weeping and crying to God, God did change his mind. Unfortunately, this time, uh, the whole world is not pleading with God, and God is not going to change his mind. But that is a very important passage to read. To our next open forum, may the Lord richly bless you.